Looking for a new career? Welcome to Do HVAC Training Service Center in North Charleston. Enroll today in our comprehensive HVAC training hands-on field experience-based program covering troubleshooting, maintenance, installation, and more on various HVAC systems and ductwork. We offer EPA and NAIT preparation and testing along with various certifications. Enjoy payment options. Achieve certification in under five months. Enroll now for your new journey of skill development and career advancement. Log on to DEWHVACTRAININGSC.COM to enroll. Choir. Heard a couple of neighbor kids play in my van, and I seen her come falling out of the van, and she landed on her head. And I, I picked her up, and her body didn't move, but I didn't know. And I put her on the bed, and I realized something was wrong. Next thing I know, the police waked me up, took me to jail, and uh, 14 months later, I went to death row for something I didn't do. That doesn't happen. My mother got off easy in the grand scheme of things. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Let's cut right to the chase. My name's Barry Jones. Recently, I just got released from prison, uh, specifically death row after spending 29 years. How's that for an introduction? It's different than any true crime story I have ever heard in my career. How do you describe day one in a place you've never been before when it's somewhere you never expected to be? If you could describe this whole experience with one word, one overall word, what would you choose? Chaos. Yeah. Absolute chaos. It was July, 1995. Barry Jones was walking into his new home to this introduction. One old boy came up there and gave me a pouch of tobacco. You know, he says, hey, uh, you know, welcome to death row for what that's worth. I was in a fog. You know, I, I can't believe this is happening. I'm going to death row for something I didn't do. That doesn't happen. Who was Barry Jones? How did this happen? And for that matter, what happened that landed Barry Jones on death row in the first place? Let's start from the beginning. Barry Jones was born in South Carolina and eventually moved out to the Tucson area with his parents and brothers in 1970. Barry grew up to be a simple man, a mechanic, an iron worker. He married his wife and they had three kids together. But everything changed for the worse with his marriage and lifestyle when addiction started to rule his life in his 30s. Got into drugs and uh, things went downhill from there. We broke up, we separated and uh, 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 things went downhill from there. He was getting into trouble with the law, not only drugs, but driving tickets, not showing up for court dates, getting his license revoked, a constant cycle, going to jail for days at a time, then being released. During this time, he met Angela Gray, a girl he started seeing, who had a four-year-old daughter named Rachel. We were together about six, six to eight weeks, something like that there, and uh, then uh, Rachel died. Barry Jones was convicted for her murder in 1994 and sentenced to death in the summer of 1995. But as we'd eventually learn, things weren't as they seemed. I needed to know from Barry's perspective. What happened that day, that night in 1994 when Rachel died? Apparently Rachel had been uh, injured several times that I didn't even know about. But uh, that day I seen her, I let her, her and a couple of neighbor kids play in my van and I seen her come falling out of the van and she landed on her head. I went out there and I got her and I said, uh, told the kids, I said, y'all, y'all gotta go home. It's, uh, you know, play time's over. Barry said he laid her down for a nap, but admittedly was more focused on the drugs he was doing at the time. Later that night, somebody comes over and says, oh, she looks really sick. And, uh, you know, she'd, uh, she'd been, you know, throwing up a little bit. And, and they said, she looks really sick. And I said, you know, I don't know anything about sick kids. Uh, my wife always took care of our children. They debated going to the hospital, but Barry, Angela, and Rachel all crawled into bed for the night. Rachel was sick, so uh, we had her sleeping with us. 
and, and, and Angela put her right up against the wall, and then it was Angela, and then it was me. But uh, Rachel, <clears throat> she said, uh, no, Mom, says, I want to sleep in the middle. She says, I want to be by Barry, too. And, uh, and I thought that was real touching, and then she says, uh, then uh, we, we, uh, we, we go to bed, and then uh, she, says, uh, she says, I love you, Barry, and I said, I love you, too. And that was the last thing she ever said to me. The next morning, Rachel was dead. Do you think you should have taken Rachel to the hospital when you noticed something was sure, wrong? Sure, hindsight, 2020, you know, but like I say, I was, I was doing so much drugs and everything, I just wasn't thinking about much of anything. Next thing I know, the police waking me up and, taking me to Pima County Sheriff's Department and interrogate me for five or six hours. And then they uh, took me to jail. And uh, 14 months later, I went to death row. Angela Gray was convicted of child abuse and failure to get medical help and served just over eight years in prison. But prosecutors claimed Barry beat Rachel, sexually assaulted her, and killed her. Did you hurt Rachel in any way? No way at all. I just, I, you know, I, I find it inconceivable that anybody could do something like that to a four-year-old child. The jury didn't buy it. Even though there was no direct evidence, Barry caused the injuries to Rachel's body. It was all circumstantial evidence and stuff they put together, you know. I mean, it's, uh, it's like reading a book, you know, if you take bits and pieces of every chapter, you can make that book mean just about anything you want to. But Barry had a history that was easy to blame. You know, he's on drugs, uh, you know, uh, he's uh, got warrants out for his arrest. He ain't got a driver's license, he's driving, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's just that kind of person. I was convicted of a crime, not because I committed a crime, but I was convicted of a lifestyle. So began his decades long stay on death row. What's life like on death row, day in and day out? You get yourself into a routine. Get up, eat, do recreation, shower, sit in your cell, repeat. A cot up against the wall, then you got a little table, then you got a sink and a toilet, pretty much it. How'd you keep your mind sane for that many years on death row? You know, you're walking around in a fog, uh, you got 10 people in the pod, and these are, these are the only people that mean anything to you because uh, they're the only people you're around. It would take a new legal team years later to relook at the case and think, something is wrong here. His new team said evidence from the autopsy showed Rachel's injuries were sustained at least a week before she died and said the medical examiner changed his testimony in each trial, pointing to inconsistencies. All along, Barry maintained he never killed Rachel, but hope can feel dismal when you're living on death row. Did you have hope that you were going to get out? Or did you think this isn't gonna work? No, I, I knew they were doing the best they could, but I knew that, uh, you know, they was fighting an uphill battle because uh, everybody told you when you first get there, it says, you know what, it says, if you didn't beat them in court, chances are you're not gonna beat them on appeal. You know, it's a hundred times harder to get somebody out of prison than it is to, to, to win a court. But it wasn't impossible. Things began to change in 2018 at an evidentiary hearing when a federal district court judge ruled Barry's convictions should be overturned. The Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit agreed. But the U.S. Supreme Court said federal courts did not have the power to review the case and sent it to the state while keeping Barry in prison. Eventually, the Arizona Attorney General's Office and Pima County Attorney's Office collaborated and agreed. Barry did not kill Rachel Gray, but offered a plea deal for second degree murder, solely based on the fact Barry should have sought medical care for Rachel when he noticed she was sick. That charge would most similarly match up to the time he already spent in prison so far, a maximum sentence for second degree murder is 25 years. But the press release from the AG's office and Pima County Attorney's office made it clear, Barry did not cause Rachel's injuries. On the second degree murder, 
we need to put uh, failure to seek medical care, meaning I didn't kill anybody, I just didn't save anybody. Even Rachel's sister wrote a letter to the judge asking him to free Barry, sure of the fact he did not kill her sister. She wrote that letter to the judge, and uh, you know, every time I think about that, I get a little misty, but. Uh, How come? You know, the judge, uh, you know, he read that letter, and uh, then he asked me a question. I couldn't even answer his question. I was all choked up. I just had to shake my head, you know, because uh, that, that was a very, very moving letter that she wrote. This is part of the podcast you likely aren't expecting to hear next, an interview I wasn't expecting to get. Recently, Rachel Gray's older sister, Rebecca Lux, reached out to me. She's the one who wrote the judge a letter. She agreed to do an interview about her side of the story and about what happened. She was 10 years old at the time. Her little sister, Rachel, was four. She was like my everything. Like, she was my baby sister, but she was like my baby at the same time. She said their lives were very unstable at the time. Their mom, Angela, was addicted to drugs. So when Barry began dating her, Rebecca said they really liked him. Barry kind of like saved us with like moving us in with him. Him and Rachel got along really well. They really did. But on that May day in 1994, when Rachel became extremely ill and Barry and Angela were more focused on drugs, Rebecca found her sister unresponsive on the ground and had watched Rescue 911 on TV, her only experience with CPR. And I, I picked her up and her body didn't move, but I didn't know. And I put her on the bed and I realized something was wrong. And I tried to give her CPR. Rebecca thought she had revived her sister, but it didn't work. Hours later, Rachel was dead. As a child, Rebecca had to testify against both Barry and her mom. She believed at the time justice was served, but when she became an adult, she started seeing issues with how this legally played out, including the fact that her mom only got just over eight years in prison while Barry was sentenced to death. You know, there's a lot of things I was never privy to. My mother got off easy in the grand scheme of things. Rebecca said in 2003 is when she first learned something might be off, but even then she was still only 19. She said a federal investigator said something to her about the case that was as disturbing as it gets. Her exact words were that my four-year-old sister's vagina looked like a 40-year-old prostitute's. And was asking me if I knew of the rumors about her selling my sister for drugs. Rebecca says horrifically, she wouldn't put it past her mother to do that, but she doesn't know what truly happened to her sister. I love her. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about her. What she does know is that she now does not believe Barry was responsible for hurting and killing Rachel at all. For years, she planned on writing a letter for his execution. Instead, that turned into her writing a letter to the judge for Barry's freedom. She feels her mom knows who hurt her sister, and Barry took the fall, spending a third of his life on death row. She has a heartfelt message for Barry now. I truly, truly do apologize. I I wanted to know that I, I I don't hate him, you know, and I truly do believe he is innocent. Barry himself will be the first to admit he was wrong that night. Fact is that I didn't seek medical care for Rachel. If I had been a, in in my right mind and and not high and stuff like that, then I, I, I surely would have. Had Barry not accepted this plea deal, he and his legal team would have kept fighting for all of his convictions to be overturned. 
But the reality is, there was no guarantee that would even work, and Barry is now in his mid-60s. We could have fought it for another 10 years, but that would have been 10 years that I didn't have with my children. June 15th, 2023. 29 years after he walked into prison, Barry Jones walked out of death row, saying goodbye to some of the most notorious killers in Arizona history, people he became close with because that's all he knew, like the baseline killer. I, we was talking about serial killers, Mark Godot, one of my best friends, one of my best friends. I mean, uh, he, he gave me a great big hug before I left death row. In death row, do you inmates talk about the crimes that you're in there for? Sometimes, sometimes. Uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about them. Uh, you know, some people will tell you, you know what, uh, it says I'm not innocent, but it didn't happen the way they say it did. I very rarely ever heard anybody on, on death row brag about what they did. You know, they says, hey, listen, uh, I did what I did. That, that, that's all there is to it. I, I can't explain it. Uh, you know, I, I never do it again, but it happened. You got to judge that man according to the way he acts once he comes through them doors. Upon release, Barry saw one of his sons for the first time. Tell you the truth, I didn't want my children seeing me in prison, so I never got no visits from him. My son came up, he hugged me, and he says, I love you, Dad. And I said, oh, wow, that, you know, that, that just made everything, you know, easy. Do you hold resentment for the U.S. justice system? No, it, uh, it's not resentment, it's disappointment. It, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I think they could do a lot better. I says, I'm not angry, I'm not aggravated. I says, I'm out of prison, I'm starting brand new. At the end of the day, there was a four-year-old girl that, that died. And you, you just ain't never gonna get over that. I got a little bit of justice because they released me, but Rachel will never get justice because they, they don't know who killed her, and, and, and they ain't never going to know because they're not going to open up a 30-year cold case. It's as if he's been born again, learning how to live in a world he doesn't know or recognize. New cars and everything, it's just uh, it, it's bewildering, you know. I come out after 29 years, I don't know nothing about this world. This is not my world. Ain't nobody willing to rent to me. I, I can't get a place to stay, you know. I'm not sure how to do check out by yourself, you know. I mean, I don't know how that works. He's likely going to work for his son. He just bought a mobile home, and he's working on getting a driver's license, thanks to his support team and family. Barry, you've been death row, you've been in prison, you know what it's like, you don't never want to go back, you're going to do whatever it takes to stay out here with your family and free world. What's your message of gratitude to those who have been helping you? Oh, I tell you what, I just, I, I don't have the words. They just, I don't know the words to tell these people how grateful I am. Now, if you could choose a word being out of prison and living life in these last couple months, what would you choose? Exhilarating, absolutely exhilarating. I mean, uh, the things that are available to people out here and, uh, you know, as scary as it is with the modern technology and everything, once you accept it and work with it, uh, it just keeps getting better. He makes sure to never forget Rachel, though. I have been to the gravesite. I have said a couple prayers. Now, in his mid-60s, he has no time to waste, perhaps never quite moving on, but learning for the first time how to move forward. How do you even emotionally come out of what you've been through? I don't know that you ever do. I'm probably going to carry that around with me for the rest of my life. And, and that's what's going to make me a better man uh, and an asset to the community. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.
Looking for a new career? Welcome to Do HVAC Training Service Center in North Charleston. Enroll today in our comprehensive HVAC training hands-on field experience based program covering troubleshooting, maintenance, installation, and more on various HVAC systems and ductwork. We offer EPA and NAIT preparation and testing along with various certifications. Enjoy payment options. Achieve certification in under five months. Enroll now for your new journey of skill development and career advancement. Log on to DEWHVACTrainingSC.com to inquire. 